Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it's my pleasure to have Justin Gottlieb with us. Justin is a sexual freedom coach based out of Miami. He supports individuals and couples in healing from past trauma and conditioning, finding their truths and gifts, and living an unapologetically authentic life. He teaches to rebel against societal norms that are outdated or ineffective and to choose your life consciously by following your bliss. Justin specializes in sex, love, and relationships. Justin, it was so great to have you on the show. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure to be here. It's great, great to to have you. So let's let's talk about sex. Um, I, you know, I actually started this podcast in 2015 with the very first episode being about sex. It was Jaya the sexologist, the famous sexologist who's now been on Goop, uh, on the Netflix show. And uh, she's really, you know, blown up. She was big back then. But, you know, that was my very first episode. I don't have a lot of episodes about sex. I've got plenty about biohacking, plenty about spirituality. But it's interesting that you can have this, this um, dovetailing of both sex and spirituality and I'd love to maybe start there and see where we can, you know, go with this this episode. So, uh, isn't there kind of a, a crossover between these two uh, concepts, or do you see them as completely separate from each other? Not only is there a crossover, um, I would say they're on the same circuit, right? And in yeah. one of my favorite books, um, Jewel and the Lotus says that sexuality and spirituality are two sides of the same coin. And um, if you really look at things from a spiritual perspective, we're, we're doing a lot of breathing up, right? We start from the lower chakras, from the root and the sacral, and that's, you know, the sexual, the primal, the earthly. And what are we typically doing? We're trying to move that energy upwards, right? And when we get to the heart chakra and we get to our hearts, even if you're not in the spiritual realm, just like to choosing from your heart. So your heart is not a lower or an upper chakra. It's actually a hinge. It's like the moment where you decide. And then you move upward even further and then you get to the third eye and the crown chakra and this is where we're more in the spiritual realm like the higher realms not that the lower realms are good or bad or, or anything it's just it's all one it's all to be accepted by us as it is but as we get up there you start to feel into the divinity of it all right but it's not that they're separate and unfortunately a lot of religions and other things that we've been taught throughout our early years have told us that sexuality is over here, keep it in the bedroom, keep it private, don't touch yourself, don't have sex till you're married, et cetera, et cetera. And what um, that does is it actually creates shame and guilt around it. So now we think that we have to go to these places like churches or wherever to be spiritual, to speak to God, when we could be speaking to God in the bedroom, right? When we could be speaking to God in our own self-pleasure rituals. Hmm. You know, there's this concept uh, that when I first heard it, it just kind of was electric for me. And it was just a passing comment. It was actually from Laurel Langmire. She is uh, not known as like a spiritual guru, but she does have a, a uh, book published by Hay House. Uh, and, and her area of focus is uh, financial success and helping people become millionaires and then multimillionaires. And she just said this passing comment when I was at one of her events uh, years ago that you can call in your baby, right? So just ask the baby to show up when you're in uh, this amazing intimate moment with your partner and you have the intention of creating life you know, or facilitating the creation of life, ask so powerful and so simple and it's like when when you are making love with your partner and you have that intention to bring life into the world i mean there's no greater more important thing for you to do i think i mean it's just one of one of the most uh so yeah let's let's talk a bit more about how to bring this kind of uh spiritual uh level of sexuality into your life on an ongoing kind of regular basis what are some of the practices and and principles that you want to um, share with our listener yes i mean one of the things i'll just piggyback off what you're saying is actually setting an intention 
before, during having uh, sex or even self-pleasure, right? So you don't need a partner to be tantric to do any of these things. In fact, our sacred sexual energy is the energy that we were created from and that we can create in any moment. And it doesn't need to be used just to create a baby or an orgasm. So Tantra teaches us that we can actually create anything we want. We are the master manifestors. We are the God and the goddess, right? We're creating our own reality in every moment. So why not, when we are in our most creative, in our sexual state, um, use that to create something else? And that could be to, yeah, to, to, to like call in a baby, right? It could also be used to call in wealth. It could be used to call in abundance. It could be used to call in the lover of your dreams. It could be used to call in health to, to um, cure yourself from an ailment. So there's no limits, right? And that's one thing that Tantra really uh, focuses on is that we typically put limits on ourselves, whether it's our ability to manifest or even our pleasure. Hmm. So if, uh, if you were to, uh, uh, try to manifest something in your life, let's say financial success, some breakthrough in your, in your wealth, I know there's a whole chapter in, uh, in uh, Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill about sexual transmutation and, and harnessing your sexual energy and applying it to being uh, more abundant financially, more prosperous. And I believe what he, he is talking about, I don't remember exactly the details, but that you don't want to uh, just... Mm, aimlessly or, or, uh, you want to capture that, that essence of the spiritual power that you have and direct it and, and, and not be unintentional about it. Right. So uh, a lot of people who are addicted to porn are not being intentional with uh, directing the, that powerful sexual energy that has like this this spiritual essence to it. They're kind of making it all about the physical and perhaps even uh, just objectifying women. And uh, I don't, I don't find that to be healthy. I don't, uh, I personally don't watch porn. I don't, uh, I don't masturbate. I don't have, an interest in doing stuff that is outside of my inner knowing and what my heart leads me to be and do in the world. And um, I know you've mentioned several times already self-pleasure. So how do you, um, how, how, how do you um, reconcile those two concepts of, well, there's no shame and guilt and self-pleasuring yourself, but then I think it's, it's healthiest to be much more intentional and spiritual with your sexual energy and not just aimlessly uh, or lustfully spill your seed. So I'm curious to hear mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I agree. And, and you kind of touched on a little bit where it's like, it's really about your intention. It's about your inner guidance. It's about really like, are you coming from this from a conscious place and from your heart? Or are you doing it for other reasons? And I coach a lot of men who have different uh, sexual dysfunctions or addictions. And they don't want that if they're conscious, right? If you're unconscious, you don't care. You're just doing it. You're watching tons of porn. You're ejaculating multiple times a day. Um, your life may be even taking back a back seat to your sexual desires and urges. You may be spending money in ways that you wouldn't really want to if you're being conscious to it. So that's a realm where there's, there are issues, right? But I'm talking about coming from a realm of a conscious space of, okay, like my body feels horny right now and I want to explore that. I want to manifest with my sexual energy and I'm going to set an intention to do X, Y, Z and I'm going to pleasure myself. Now there's a difference between self-pleasure and masturbation. Self-pleasure is being in this very divine state of enjoying pleasure and seeing what shows up. So not having this destination or goal in mind, whereas masturbation in the most typical sense is I'm going to play with my genitals until I have an orgasm. And for men, typically I'm going to ejaculate and then I'm going to go, go on with my day. 
And um, a lot of times I find that masturbation is coming typically more from a state of I'm avoiding something, I'm procrastinating something, I need to get a quick good feeling because I'm unhappy, I'm lonely, etc. Um, and again, there's that means to the end. Whereas self-pleasure could be standing in front of a mirror and looking at yourself in the nude and just taking yourself in and honoring your body. It could be honoring your genitals. You know, I teach women about um, yoni gazing, which is a beautiful practice of just gazing into the vagina. Yoni means sacred space and source, and it's a beautiful Sanskrit word for vagina. Um, you also can pleasure yourself by touching your body in the shower and not even focusing on genitals, right? And if you do happen to get very aroused and it goes there, that's okay. There's no shame in having an experience that turns into an ejaculation or, or an orgasm or whatever it may be, but you're doing it consciously. And you're doing it because you're being guided that way by the divine, by your heart, by your conscious mind, not by anything else. Mm. So this is, uh, this is interesting because <clears throat> what I learned in Kabbalah is that so before Eve, there was Lilith and Lilith is kind of like the queen of the demons. <laughs> and, uh, she sends her minions out to steal seed from men who are masturbating. And they make, make these demons, uh, from that. They just need this tiny, tiny, tiny amount. And I know this might sound uh, fantastical, but there's a lot of, really magical and, and and real stuff in Kabbalah. So, you know, take what works for you or what what is uh, helpful, regardless of whether it's Kabbalah or some other spiritual or religious uh, modality, and discard the rest, right? Don't use what doesn't work for you. But this is something that I learned in Kabbalah, and I'm curious to hear your take on that, because uh, that kind of goes very contrary to what you just said. Like if you're spilling your seed and that's being used to create demons and by, conversely, by the way, when you have really virtuous and, and pure thoughts, words, and deeds, you create positive angels, very positive, powerful angels that can assist you. So every time you say a kind word, every time you have a nice intention to do something for others and you follow through with that, if you're doing all three in concert, the pure thought, word, and deed, amazing. But you maybe have an ill intention or you don't really mean it, but you just want to look good. And so it looks like you're doing a positive action uh, and you're saying a positive word, but you don't really like the person and you're not letting on. Well now you're creating mischievous angels <laughs> that mm -hmm. won't lie to you and that is they're not terribly helpful like they there's some uh, a mix of good and bad in there so yeah i know pretty out there for some of us uh but i would love to hear <laughs> justin what, yeah. are you, what are your thoughts on that yeah and i'm glad you asked because you know again you mentioned in my intro i i rebel against societal norms i really want people to come from their truth and there isn't a a one answer for everyone so don't get me wrong there yeah. uh, but there is a huge subsect of tantra in the realm that i work in and play in um that is about semen retention right and they'll tell you you should not be uh, ejaculating and many of them will be not ejaculating for months and months at a time and there's a whole thought process there's a the science there's everything around it um, but again, yeah. I also, in fact, it's a biohacking thing, isn't it? So Dave Asprey but, says, uh, according to, to science and research, uh, biological, um, you know, processes and stuff that, uh, they've studied, uh, retaining your semen for at least, uh, what is it? 10 to 14 days, something like that for somebody who's middle-aged, it depends on your age, but the older you get, the more you should retain it for, for your health. Uh, yeah, so I have heard that as well. Yeah, but please yeah, and, and, yeah there, could, there could be some benefits to that. Now, I think that it's kind of like the pendulum has swung too far. I speak to most men. I say, how many times do you masturbate? Some are saying once or twice or three times a day. Now, if that's mm -hmm. happening and you're ejaculating that much, um, I would say that would be on the, the other end of the spectrum. And of course, there's people with sexual addictions who it's many more times than that. Now, that I would say is probably mm -hmm. not a, a healthy thing to be doing. 
But if you're having beautiful tantric sex with your partner and you're ejaculating and you're, you know, using condoms or whatever you're doing in a safe way, or maybe you're trying to have a baby, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Now, that's my personal opinion. I'm not doing all the research on this. I'm just, again, what works for me and what I like to share with people because sometimes it gets too extreme. And now people are focusing yeah. their whole life on not ejaculating and it's bad to ejaculate. And now you've created this goal that honestly, I think it goes against, if you believe in God and how we were created a bit against our biology, we are able to ejaculate what every 20 minutes. I don't think that was a mistake. I don't think we were meant to be able to spread our seed and, and procreate and do all the things we were, we were, we were you know, created to do. And now it's like, well, we're going to say no, no, no to that. We're going to decide that it's only every three months that you should do that. So again, somewhere in between these extremes is the thing that's going to work for you. I just don't like anyone saying to me that, well, if you don't do this, then what? You're bad. There's demons. There's this. Of course, there's all these theories and all these things that come about, but I'm going to experiment and see what works for me. And for me, being able to occasionally ejaculate when it feels really good, especially when I'm with my woman, um, I don't want to be sitting there going into my head going, oh, no, no, I got to stop. I got to you know, make sure I don't do this. Now, you can also learn how to transmute that energy and have an ejaculation as a man. Um, I do think that's a lot rarer to be able to do that than people say and think. And I think it also becomes this kind of spiritually bypassed, like I'm a, you know, I've reached some level. And I don't like that when it comes to spirituality that like, well, I haven't ejaculated in this long and I have these full body orgasms. And it's like, well, you need to get here too. So I'm really much more trying to come from a place of it's all love and we can all create the perfect lives we want. However, that may come around with sexuality from a conscious space. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, uh, Good thoughts. And uh, I love what you're saying about being more about what works and what's workable rather than what's right or wrong, because your heart knows, like, just drop, drop into your heart, get out of your head, get into your heart. And if it feels good and to in, in, in tune and, and aligned, then you're probably on the right path. But if it feels off, like, oh, I don't know if I should be going on this porn site. Uh, you know, I got to delete my history afterwards mm -hmm. and all that. Your heart's not saying, oh, this is amazing. We're on the, we're on the track here. We're on the, we're on the path. No, you're, you're saying, oh, this mm -hmm. is making me uncomfortable because I, I don't want to get caught. Mm -hmm. Not good. Yeah, there's, not, there's, not, there's not a helpful. wisdom. No, it's not, again, not good, not right, not wrong, not bad. It's just not workable. If your partner catches you and, you know, the stuff does end up getting, you know, caught, right? Because by design in this, in this, um, this game of life, you're meant to stumble and get caught and learn from your mistakes and do things differently and grow and evolve because of it. So it's all, this is all, it's all designed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but it's a good point. You're saying like, you know, how does it feel in your heart and like, is what you're doing serving you? And I think that's, that's part of my definition of self-love is, are you doing things in your life that serve you? And then secondly, do you feel that you're worthy of love? Do you really let love in? Do you give love in that way? And that's an important thing to keep in mind in whatever you're doing. But there's also mm -hmm. wisdom in your sex, right? We talk about womb wisdom for women. Women can really tap into their womb and there is guidance and there's divinity in there. I mean, that is the portal where life comes from. If a woman puts her hands on her womb and just closes her eyes and breathes, there will be something that comes through to them. And I think for men, we don't necessarily have a womb, of course, but we may have an energetic womb and we may have a space there where we can also tap into that gives us some guidance. And I think, and I know from my personal experience that after I ejaculate or as I'm ejaculating, it is the most clear I am because it's the only time where I just feel like there's nothing in my mind. I am just a vessel, right? Because mm -hmm. before that, I'm, you know, there's sexuality, there's energy. We're thinking I'm with this beautiful goddess and all this stuff's going on. And maybe I'm able to clear that a little bit, but then boom. And then after there's this moment after ejaculation or maybe after orgasm, if you're able to ejaculate without uh, uh, have an orgasm without ejaculation, where it all is like coming back and you're now you're back down to earth. And now you're looking at that porn site and you're going, oh, no. Right. And if that's the feeling you're getting after this divine experience, likely what you were masturbating to or whatever you were doing doesn't serve you. Now, not good, bad, wrong. 
but it probably doesn't serve you. But if you come out of that experience and you just are like, oh my God, and you look at yourself in the mirror and you're just feeling divine, amazing. Or maybe you look into the eyes of your lover and you are just like in heaven. Now maybe what you were doing <laughs> sexually or whatever is serving it. So it's a good indicator that your sexuality can also provide divine guidance and give you direction into what you're doing or what you're going. Why I got into the work that I do is um, our sexual energy, our sexuality, our relationships, love, um, self-love, all of that is such an important part of our life. And it's a fuel to every other area of our lives, whether it's our careers or um, family or whatever it may be, right? But we put so little effort in really consciously thinking about it and planning on it. I mean, so many people I know just kind of got into relationships and maybe they're with the right person or maybe they're not. But do they really think about what they want for their life when it comes to relationships, when it comes to sexuality? And what I do is I really help people come back into their hearts and say like, okay, well, is this the relationship dynamic I ever wanted? I know way too many men, especially and some women who don't want to be in monogamous relationships and they never really wanted to, but they just defaulted into monogamy because that's what it was. And now they feel stuck, but they really feel stuck because they aren't able to communicate with their partner about what their desires are. Right. So it's a whole nother realm of being able to understand that I can tell my partner what I feel. Um, even if you maybe got past a, what you think to be a point of no return and to be able to work things out. And that to me is true love, right? Being able to communicate fully and openly, not having to hide things and then being able to work through whatever comes up in that, whether it's, you know, shadow work, um, and, and different things that may trigger you, but be able to move past that. Uh, but the same, you know, that's relationships and that's just one aspect of it is like the dynamic, but what kind of lifestyle do you want to have, et cetera. And then also around sexuality, like so many people aren't exploring what their true fantasies are, or even more importantly, what are their boundaries? How many people are getting steamrolled in their own sex life because they're not sharing and, and openly even thinking about their boundaries. And these two areas are so important because it's what keeps us safe to be able to have boundaries and also to be able to share our desires and allow us to use this beautiful body and this vessel that we have to explore our five senses. Um, it's part of why we're here, right? And to be able to feel safe is going to allow our body to be able to do all the magical things that it can. And too many people, again, aren't doing that. And that's why the work that I do, whether you kind of come in the realm of Tantra or coaching or whatever it is, is so important for people to, um, to access nowadays. Yeah. Now you, you coach people on Tantra. What does that, what does that mean? Like what's a Tantra coach <laughs> and, <laughs> and how, how does, uh, how does that uh, manifest changes in their lives uh, over the course of the months or maybe even years that you work with a, a client? Yeah, so I, I would say a Tantra coach is someone who coaches with the foundation of the teachings of Tantra. And um, what is Tantra? Well, Tantra has a lot of Sanskrit and esoteric definitions, expansion and weaving and doctrine and a lot of different words for the same word, which confuses people. So I teach more modern Tantra. I want to be able to have people understand it and walk away from my experiences and sessions knowing this is what Tantra is, but not only in their mind and also in their body. So I do a lot of body work as well, which we can get into. But from a coaching aspect, to me, Tantra is these things, self-love, self-acceptance, presence, and connection. Self-love, I mentioned before, are you doing things in your life that serve you? And are you allowing love in and to be love and to really understand unconditional love? Self-acceptance is accepting all within you. So I will coach my clients to be fully accountable for everything that happens in their life and all that they are. So that means accepting your sexuality, all of even your deepest, darkest, horny fantasies. You get to accept them. That doesn't mean you get to do them, but you get to accept them and see what is happening under them. Uh, where there's horniness, there's healing, right? There's something to look at where you are being really horny. Um, and then also you get to accept your body, right? We cannot be walking around this world with this body going, I hate my breasts. I don't like my belly fat. I feel, you know. If you do that, you are resisting the divine. You are resisting what is going on. Your hands are not free to create new possibilities because you're literally pressing up against that which is. So instead, you can have your hands be free. You can take a breath. You can do all different sorts of exercises, which I coach people on, to come into full self-acceptance. The other side of self-acceptance is also accepting all of our emotions. 
So that means accepting greed and hate and anger and all of these things that come out through us that we want to rid ourselves of. Well, I'm sorry, you're not going to have a good time ridding yourself of anger, right? It's part of the human experience. You're going to get angry. But to accept that angry uh, anger and to invite it to the table with all of your other emotions that you like, your happiness and your joy and your play and all these other things, that is the first step to truly becoming tantric. So self-acceptance is why I got into Tantra. You know, and Osho spoke about it. It's, it's like, you know, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't like try to cast off our eyes or our hands or parts of our body like that we use every day. Like, why would you do that? So why would we cast off anger? Why would we cast off our sexuality? We need to accept ourselves in our totality. So that's really like what drew me in because so many other teachings and religions and things like that were teaching us that like part of us, who we are, is not okay. And that just doesn't work for me. And now presence. So, you know, so of, you're saying that's you know, like, that's part of shadow work too, is to not uh, disconnect or disassociate from the shadow side of yourself, but to accept all of you in your worst moments, as well as your best moments and uh, know that you're human and not uh, a robot or not, not just this saint who can only do, wonderful saintly things and uh i think that's something that i personally feel like i need to work more on is is uh accepting that shadow side mm -hmm. yeah and that's huge we have to love our shadows not just accept it but love our shadows love the parts of us that you know maybe seem dark and heavy and we get to work with them right if you don't again i say bring them to the table invite them to the table with you they're going to be over there on that side of the room causing havoc. And that's not what, how we're going to become whole as, as human beings and to live a happy, fulfilled life. So again, that, that side of us, we have to, I enjoy doing shadow work. I love it. Now I, I see people going through tons of pain doing shadow work. You can do that. You could have these huge catharsis that are like painful and it's like you're dying and some people need that. I have catharsis and I'm like, I hope I could cry. Like it's not easy for me to cry. If I could cry, if I could scream, if I could have my whole body just like let go fully, whether it's in an experience or a whole retreat or whatever kind of work I'm doing, I'm super happy about that. And I see that as a great progress. Um, and I think that's an important part of this is being able to see that kind of work as progress, as growth, as a, an important part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah. And I think an important uh, piece of this too, uh, for us to articulate for our listener is that we have a body we are not our body right it's like a body suit that you're wearing or that's like your essence of your soul is infused throughout your body and that body you can take to the shower or to go to the gym or to have a delicious meal or into uh you know amazing sexual um experience and to not disconnect or dissociate from your body, but also to not identify as only your body because you are not your body. You have a body. You are not the body. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, listen, everyone's body is different too. And what we like to do is compare and we've got the media and everything trying to be like, this is what you should look like and whatever. And like, in reality, like it's not going to happen. You're not going to look like anyone else, really. So we have to be in a space and actually understand that our body is this vessel that we came in as spirit, right? So we are, I like to think of this way, we are spirits floating around. We've done something amazing. And the grand spirit says to us, good job. Guess what your bonus level is going to be? You get this amazing gift. You're going to send, we're going to send you down to earth and you're going to get to go into this body and you're going to experience what we call the five senses. So imagine that instead of just being this spirit floating around, you're going to get to feel what it's like to touch yourself, to touch someone else, to breathe and smell something and to have a scent, to see a beautiful sunset, to taste the sweet mangoes. And this is going to be your gift. So go play that game. And by the way, we're going to, one more thing, you're not going to know anything about the moments prior and your spirit life when you are down on earth in this bonus level. So enjoy it. And it's crazy because we come in as if we are not all knowing. We come into this body as just this baby as if we don't know anything. 
And part of the problem is I think a lot of parents and just people in general, we go to babies, we go goo goo gaga instead of going up to them being like, what can you teach me? You just came in. You might remember some things. I don't know. And some people do say they come into this world with memories and they know languages and they have all these other things going on. Why are we all so different in that sense? But yeah, to right. be able well, to see your body. And, and toddlers, they can see angels, many of them. Yeah, yeah I like think a, there, there's a purity that they, they have that we've got kind of, we get, I, they used to say in the gratitude trainings, it was like, you know, you're this diamond. And what happens is unfortunately, like some dirt and earth and all this other stuff gets on it and you forget that you're this diamond, but the babies know they're the diamond. Yeah. And they have that heavenly smell to them too, when they uh, are babies, that that's another uh, uh, non-random, uh, non-coincidental sign of our, our uh, divinity. You know, when they come in. Yeah. Amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to so, use so our you, bodies. You, you shared two, two things that I want to get back to, you know, finish your thought for sure, but I want to make sure we cover all four of those key concepts that you teach in your coaching. So we covered self-love, we covered self-acceptance. So there's two more that we want to delve into, but yes, go yes. ahead. And, and I'll just briefly thoughts. say, um, <clears throat> we are also get to really use our body to their, to its fullest extent. Right. So it's not just knowing that we're not, we're body, but also like, wow, we have this amazing car. Are we going <clears> to <throat> use it? Like it's a Lamborghini. We're going to use it. Like it's an old beat up Chevy that, you know, we're going to kind of just like tread very lightly, you know? So it's really up to you. You got to be smart and be healthy, but also like use this body experience, all the pleasures, see all the things you can see, listen to all the music you can really live fully. And what I like to say, I live my life by, and I coach my clients into is following your bliss. So follow your bliss. Um, <clears throat> the other two uh, pillars of Tantra that, that I like to talk about is presence. Okay. Presence you hear a lot in the spiritual realm, but truly being present. Can I enjoy and be in the here and now and not worrying about the past, not worrying about the future, all the different things that hold us up from enjoying the moment. And that's really, again, a really important about, important part about Tantra that I love, which is that we can let go of the goals. We can let go of this performance and we can actually be in the moment and just see the signs. And I know you're really good at this, Stefan, but truly just seeing the signs and let that guide us. You know, if you see, you run into someone who like three times, it's like, okay, maybe there's something about this person that I should explore. You know, like when I'm in a breathwork session and all of a sudden a flashback happens and it's like, oh man, I don't remember that friend of mine from like ninth grade. Maybe I go find him on Facebook and just reach out and just say, hey, how are you? You know, I don't have to plan out what it is. But when signs are shown to me, that could be the movie script that is already laid out for my life. That's so perfect that I could never come up with better than the divine or the universe or God could. So why try to figure it all out myself? So that's part of being present. If you're not present, you're not going to see those signs. You're going to be worrying about, oh, I just planned this. I'm doing that. I'm, I've got to get this going. I got to meet with this person. And you're going to miss all the beauty and all the signs that are already there for you. So that's presence. And that one's self-explanatory, but so, so important for Tantra. And the last one's connection. And connection isn't just about, um, you know, connection with other people. Connection with yourself. Can you be alone and not lonely? Can you truly connect with yourself in all kinds of different moments in time and wherever you are in the world? And also, can you connect with others? And I'm not just talking about friends and family. I'm talking about, yeah, really being with, we're there with them, letting go of your phone. And like, I sometimes do a kind of morbid exercise and I'm like, well, first of all, I do it with myself. Like, what if I was on my deathbed? Would I be proud of all the moments I spent in my life with what I was doing with my job and all of these things? And that really keeps me close to death, right? Um, in a good way. And then also, what if this person weren't here tomorrow? Would I be happy with how I just spent my last hour with them? And those kind of ways of connecting can go really deep for you. But it's not mm -hmm. just that either. It's also, how do we connect with this earth? You know, are we connected to Pachamama, to, to Mother Earth? Are we connected to the grass? Can we just walk around barefoot and feel the energy of the earth? Can I really appreciate, I mean, it's mango season here in Florida and I am just dumbfounded how this tree just gives me the most delicious fruit every morning. So much so, so much abundance. I'm just like, please someone take my mangoes. I have so many, you know, but to really honor that rather than like, oh no, all these mangoes, how annoying. This is such a, you know, bitch to deal with. Right. And to also know that the answers can happen and can be there. 
you know, I once did an amazing exercise in a retreat I'll give to you all. And it was so simple. It was ask yourself a question you're having a problem finding the answer to or finding um, a truth in. And then just walk around in some place in nature, right? And in this case, we're out at a retreat. We walked around the backyard. And you ask a question, then you just look deeply into nature. And I was really struggling with like, what was my purpose? What am I going to do with my life? And how am I going to do it? And I look and I'm for the first time in a, I don't even know if I ever did this as a kid, but like I see this ant hole and I'm seeing these ants go into the hole and bring out one little granular of sand or dirt or whatever it was. And they go and they were just bringing it like right to the edge. They went up and over and brought it outside so that it wouldn't fall right back in on them. And I had realized most of my life I was taking shortcuts. I was going the easy way out. And just by looking at these ants, doing all the hard work, carrying these things that are five times as heavy as their body, whatever it was, and then not just putting it right there, but going over. So nature, the connections in nature showed me an answer without me having to go to do anything more, how to, to go through really tough, deep work. It's right there for you if you choose to look at it. Yeah. <clears throat> do, you ever, uh, do you ever connect with the souls of the trees? I haven't specifically done it that way, but tell me. Well, I learned this last year, maybe it was uh, two years ago, but I think it was last year. Yeah, Tu Bishvat is a Jewish holiday I didn't really know anything about. But last year, I, I, just, I, I was taught by my sister-in-law uh, a bit about that holiday, and it's a celebration of the trees, and she told me that tr trees have souls, which is really uh feels very true to me you know like the, the thing we talked about earlier about get in your heart and if it feels right if it's like it feels like your inner knowing is guiding you in the right place or that this is aligned with it then you're probably on track and it feels right to me it feels true and so you know this is I, I, it just blows my mind that there are uh people deriding uh, nature lovers as tree huggers. And th that's like a derogatory way of referring to them. I agree. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Like, yeah, hug trees because trees are amazing and they're, they have souls and, and it's also, they're deeply connected, uh, to mother earth. As you say, it's like, uh, it's a direct connection. They don't have that illusion of separation that we do. So I think just, it's amazing. And there's a whole holiday in Judaism to celebrate uh, those trees and you get, well, you know, like nuts and, and, and fruit berries and things like that to uh, um, celebrate the holiday. It's really cute. That's beautiful. Oh, yeah. I, I, when people ask me, cause I've been all over the world and I love nature and love going to different places and I'm a Miami guy, I'm a beach guy but there's no more healing place than the redwood forest in California to me. I mean, that energy, it's the sun shines through into like the misty air of the forest. And there's this like foggy steam and these trees that have been there for hundreds of years. And you're just like, who am I, you know? And you could just sit there asking yourself that question. Who am I? What have these trees seen? And what an amazing like experience. And there's all kinds of places in the world where you can have that kind of thing. But to me, the redwood forests are so special. Um, you brought up another point that, that made me think of this. So, um, you know, we, people don't understand also, we were living in this stressful world and I lived in Manhattan for nine years and it was, uh, it was a lot, there's a lot of chaos going on and a lot of concrete jungle vibes and there are, but there are places you can go and be in the grass, right. Or your central park kind of, for example. So wherever you are in the world, if you really feel stressed out and no one tries this, very few people do this except for the tree hugging hippies, right. Um, to actually just go barefoot and stand in the grass. And there's something that happens with that. So uh, the root chakra, which is one of the chakras and energy meridian is the chakra that's really around safety and security. Um, it's your foundation. It's your base. Something that a lot of people don't know is, well, a lot of people will sit cross-legged and they sit up and that's why they're meditating. They want their root and all their chakras aligned, right? Well, your legs and your feet are all extensions of your root chakra. So when you go stand out onto the grass and your feet are firmly planted in that grass, you feel grounded, you feel safe, you feel secure, and you actually are absorbing energy and giving energy back to the earth. 
And what an amazing way to charge or recharge or whatever you're doing or, or ground yourself and then go back into your day. But again, for some, it seems too wacky or whatever, but it's like, like everything else, try it out. If it doesn't work for you, fine. I don't think it won't work for you. I don't think you won't feel better standing on this grass on this miracle that grows every day after you cut it, you know, once a week and still keeps growing and coming back. So um, that kind of way of connecting with nature, like it's there for you. It's there to provide for you. So when you look at everything, you know, self-love, self-acceptance, presence, connection, put those quadrants and those pillars into any area of your life, especially the bedroom. And that's where the most people are having problems. That's why a lot of people associate Tantra with sex. Tantra isn't just about sex. It's a very small sliver of it. But considering it's probably the only teaching, the only discipline that truly accepts sexuality, that's why it gets all the headlines. And that's why people equate Tantra with sex. But if you bring self-acceptance and self-love and presence and connection into the bedroom, think about all the things that will heal. Think about all the problems that would go away. You'd be able to communicate. You'd be loving your body. You would feel love for yourself. You'd be connected to your partner. You'd be present in the moment. All the sexual dysfunctions, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, most of the times when I coach men, I can get them in a week for that to not fully subside or at least uh, be something that they can have more power over. And that's simply from having them be connected and present in the bedroom. Mm, that's awesome. And uh, some men can do multiple orgasms and uh, not ejaculate and just do a whole series of them. Can you elaborate a bit on that, how that works? And if you've had some successes with clients uh, getting to that level? You know, I, I shy away from kind of making that a goal for people because um, I have not been, I've had expanded orgasms. I don't think I've ever had something where I felt like it was multiple orgasms. I've had what I thought could have been a Kundalini awakening. I don't know though. Like, how do you really know if what you're having is what someone else is having? You know, I liken mm -hmm. it to this, like I have lower back pain. I have no idea if the back pain that I'm walking around with is excruciatingly and like would have someone laid out for days and I'm just kind of have a lower threshold or, or tolerance for it uh, or higher tolerance for it or, or what. So I don't know exactly. I may have had multiple orgasms 10 times. It's just hard to kind of pin it down, which is why I don't really want to get to a goal in that realm. But I know a lot of people that do. So what I try to have people do is just to be able to come into their bodies and come into a present state. And one of the main things I teach is about breathing. What do most people do when they're about to have an orgasm and orgasming, clench up their body, hold their breath. And what you're doing is locking all the energy in place. The opportunity for you to have an expansive orgasm or multiple orgasms it really becomes almost zero. And especially for women who have, so I've worked with many women who've never had an orgasm or have only had clitoral orgasms with vibrators. It's because they need to really surrender. They need to trust. They need to be in a safe space. And part of that is actually relaxing the body fully and breathing. You want to breathe that energy up. And once you do that, it opens up all these different pathways. It also tells the body you're safe. You know, you're filled with air. You're safe. You're not like this. Oh my God, fight or flight, you know, and in that kind of space, I think anything's possible. So that's really the first step. And from there, there's lots of other exercises that we can do to help, um, expand orgasms or, or create something in the realm of multiple orgasms. Hmm. Nice. Now, can you uh, elaborate on your Kundalini awakening or what you believe might have been a Kundalini awakening? What is that? And how, how did you come to, to have that experience? Yeah. So I was at a retreat. It was called Kadoshka. Not a lot of people know of this. It's kind of this, I don't know. I don't, it's a little infamous because like, I think the founder said that it was created from like indigenous tribes. And um, I, I don't know where it was really created from, but all I know is it feels like a mix of like native American rituals with Tantra and sacred sexuality. So we're doing medicine wheels. We're smoking from peace pipes. They do um, the Temescal, the, 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 um, what are they called? The, the teepees with the heat at the, with the fire and everything. So you're doing all that kind of stuff, but then you're also doing like sacred sexual work, including work that is all around um, what is your genital type, right? So they have different types that are related to different animals and you can actually see what your personality type is based on the type of genitals, but lots of different descriptions around that as well. Really cool work, very interesting stuff. Again, I'm like a try anything uh, once kind of guy. 
And um, we were doing a lot of really cool work in there. And I get back to my room and I'm in bed alone. And all of a sudden I just start having these like kind of shakes. And I'm like, okay, well, let me just relax into it. And then it just felt like this energy was spiraling up around me. Again, I'm not like super, super sensitive to energy. I'm not one of those people who would just kind of jump out of bed and start screaming or whatever, but I just felt this surge. And I was like, something happened there. And it felt great. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm also not going to like put too much meaning onto it. I'm just going to be here and be thankful and grateful that I had this experience. Um, from that point on, I mean, can I say that much shifted for me? I don't know. I think I've always been very open and very free and really living in my bliss. But it was definitely something I'd never experienced before. And anytime I could have a new experience that I really enjoy in life, I am grateful, blessed, and super, super happy. That's awesome. And uh, I mean, it was meaningful for you. You, you I'm, I'm guessing we'll never forget that. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember exactly where it was, the moment, the feeling, and just like questioning it, though, was the, was the part that got me. It's like, why am I questioning this? Why does it have to be an awakening that someone else has put a name on or whatever? What if it's just me being my divine self and my body just letting me know that, hey, you're divine and look what you can feel. And, and by the way, don't forget that all the experiences you've had, all the sensations you've had, there's no limit. You know, that's what I like to tell people. Our orgasms that we've had, we think that that's it. The way that we, we self-pleasure or masturbate or whatever we're doing, we think that that's it. But the second something else comes along, you go, oh, wait a second, I'm limitless. I absolutely can do anything else. And this is something that I could give all the listeners here, just a quick tidbit of advice is, have, has your way that you pleasure yourself changed at all since maybe you first learned how to do it? You know, most men masturbate and they just do this, right? It's just that thing. Most women are just doing one thing and maybe now they're just using a vibrator, right? And that's just how it's been for years. And in almost everything else in life, we kind of stop and check, you know, at work, we have a, a end of year review. Like, this is how you've been doing things. This is what we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. So I urge everyone to take a moment and just be like, what could I do different? You know, could I even just change the lighting in the room and the music and the sound and the sounds that I hear and the candles? Could I add some massage oil to what I'm doing? Could I, instead of starting and doing it this way, can I do it a different way? Can I let go of the vibrator or, or whatever assistance I have and instead just use my hands and my fingers and just be okay with getting to wherever I get with that experience? Mm -hmm. And something like that can open up a huge doorway to everything else. How am I having sex in my life? How am I loving in my life? How am I communicating in my life? And get out of the routine and into the truth, which is that you are God or you are goddess and you can create anything you want in your life. Yeah. So I think it might've been Jaya who said this, uh, maybe somebody else, but these, these uh, patterns that we have habits, they become grooves in the brain, right? Grooves and those grooves become ruts and those ruts eventually become graves. And mm -hmm. yeah, like what you're saying is uh, mix it up, get outside of your normal patterns. And uh, that's where you get the healthy growth happening and just being stuck in the same rut <laughs> over and over again, eventually becomes a grave. So. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of quotes around that that kind of stuff that like, I just, you have to keep listening to these things. Otherwise you live your life in a routine and then, you know, and this is why I did that. Like deathbed experience is like, next thing you know, you're 90 and you're going, wow, I just spent like my entire career working for some company who in the end, like it didn't even matter when I retired. It didn't even matter. You know, and how was I spending my day every hour I was on my computer, I was on this and like, am I proud of that? I don't know, but you have to really look at that. This is a quote I love, similar to what you heard there, which is, comfort is not your friend. It comes as a guest, remains as your host, and stays in your life to enslave you. Hmm. And that is something so powerful to me because we like, a lot of people want to be comfortable in that sense. But when you really think about it, I'm like, you know, I could watch Netflix every single night of my life and be super comfortable and enjoy it and have my great, like, I'm escaping it all. And I could enjoy that. I might even learn a thing or two. But that's comfortable. What I'm really going to learn and grow is when I'm in my deep shadow work or I'm going to some retreat all the way across the world, learning about something I never knew about, putting myself in situations that makes me go, <gasps> you know, 
And that's the kind of thing that more and more people need to start doing because it's getting easier and easier to stay comfort comfortable thinking that that's, that's great. And then realizing that it's, it's the enemy enslaving you. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> now you mentioned that this, uh, retreat, uh, you went to, they had, uh, the huts with the heat that's uh, that's called a sweat lodge right yes sweat lodge i actually wasn't able yeah. to do it at that retreat because there was a uh i don't know there was like a drought a drought over there and there was a fire rules in italy it was actually the the countryside of florence it was absolutely beautiful mm, okay have you ever done a sweat lodge no i haven't done a sweat lodge i've done plenty of other things like that you know like ayahuasca bufo all the other plant medicine ceremonies what I like about this, the idea of the sweat lodge, having done it though, but is, is that it's, it's just you, right? If it's just you, I really like that. When we, we add plant medicine, we add any kind of other supplements, um, you, you can always blame your vision, what you got on something else. And when I do my Tantra massage sessions, I require all my clients to be fully sober. Even if you're like a caffeine hopped up kind of person, I say no caffeine that morning. I want you to in your purest energy so that whatever you feel, whatever you experience, whatever downloads you get, whatever empowerment you feel, you know it was just from you. So any kind of experiences that are like that, I think those are great. And I have nothing against plant medicine. I'm just sitting, it is a, it's a gateway to realizing what you can do on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you've done ayahuasca, uh, mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Right? One time, one time. I've had one, plenty okay. of more opportunities to do it. And that one time was just, mind-blowing and beautiful and i learned everything i needed to learn i just hasn't called me again and I, I really honor myself for that for really having it be a ceremony and and respecting grandmother in that sense because i think a lot of people in america are just doing it often and whenever it comes their way and um, if that's the case then it starts to become more like a drug than um than this like honoring of this plant medicine mm-hmm yeah, I've never done it. I've not done any drugs at all, ever. Um, wow. I, I have had experiences that are like psychedelic trips and, and um, yeah. Well, you're that, like a drug yourself, of... Stefan. I mean, I talk to you sometimes and I'm just like, <laughs> wow. Like, they'll just be like, I just got like a reading and uh, you should be reading, you should read this book. And I'm like, oh, okay, check that out. And like, you just have these downloads and you, you are seeing things that people might only see or heal or feel or, or receive when they're on drugs. So I think that's um, a beautiful thing to recognize that and be like, well, I don't really need to do anything else because I'm, I'm already receiving it all. Um, but I do think for some people that don't have that kind of ability, it is important to, to experience the gateway, to see what yeah. portal opens up when you maybe have an experience like that, whether it is a Temescal or it's a, a, a uh, ayahuasca, whatever it is that calls you. But I think that's the key mm -hmm. is it's got to call you. And if it's really calling you and you know, you've got an intention or something you really are hoping to be seen and, and you're also okay with it showing you something else. And that was something I learned through ayahuasca and the journey that I went on was you don't, don't try to resist what it's showing you. You might come here being like, I need healing for my breakup. I need to finally get past 